let's see our runner-ups. First, we have W1. Can never say no to going out with friends, even when she doesn't want. Second, W2. Her family has decided her future for her, even though she wants things differently. Which one of the runner-ups are regarded as the strongest woman or are guided by the public opinions? Let's find out on this week's show, Friday at 3 p.m. Psst, not to miss. Coming up on today's show. Oh, that taxi was taking us around. And then we met the police on the way. So it's teenagers, 14, 15 years old. Here we are, we have alcohol. The police stopped us. And then when I look back, I was like, I've never seen a liar like me because really I was a true liar. Thanks to that we became friends would... when you quit lying. <laughs> Isn't that all? Did you learn your lesson? No, I did not learn my lesson. Be three nights. I remember I was three a professional nights. liar. I was really a professional liar. Um, I remember. Stay tuned. women. We are brave, strong, capable, unique. We are women to women. Good afternoon, South Africa. We have been together throughout the month of March, the month we celebrate International Women's Month. And today we bring to you, not the final, but one last of the behaviors that a strong woman does not have. We hope that you have been benefiting, learning, making adjustments, and becoming stronger every week. Every Friday, we are together. So today, we hope we are going to contribute further. In the same way that we bring to you, we learn in the process, we enjoy, and we have been learning through the testimonies and the accounts of our friends so that we can become true, strong women of God. Today, we are going to speak about one of the common things that make women very weak. And we don't realize until we lived that situation and we saw the other side. And now we look back and say, what was I thinking? We are talking about guided by public opinion. When all your decisions, all your thoughts, all your dreams, your behavior, career choices are made based on other people's opinion not of your own. So let us explore how someone who is guided by public opinion, by people's opinion, behave. The way she dresses, the way she carries herself, the way she speaks, where she goes, to the extent of life decisions, where she's going to study, where she's going to work, which career, and even friends, and marriage. And the consequence of that is the person gets so confused who she is. And we would like to say, people's opinion about you, it is not the reality. It is not or who you are. That's the point. And of course, when you are guided by people's opinion, and it's like a tug of war, of feelings, of doubts, you end up becoming people's pleaser. And we have other side effects to that. The first effect is, what is right for them may not be right for you, may not be pleasant for you. And it's said when you agree and do anyway, bringing dissatisfaction, frustration, and making you to second-guess yourself. Their dreams are not really your dreams. And how it should be, or probably it is, frustrating to be 
friends with people that you don't really empathize, that you don't think in the same way, going places that you don't like, visiting um, or traveling to places that you have no interest, worse, building up a career that is not your choice. In all that process, many say they have lost their identity. You know that moment when you wake up and say, who am I? What do I like? Do I like pink? Do I like blue? Because until now, everyone told me, pink, 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 but I don't feel like pink. I prefer brown. And now I don't know who I am anymore. That is the saddest moment, hitting bottom for someone who lives out of public opinion. We are not going to talk about self-frustration, anxiety, and depression, because you already know that those who have been guided by public opinion constantly have come to that unfortunate condition of losing even the taste, the joy for life. Today we have here Julian. Julian is a pastor's wife with us, and the reason why she's here, because she had lived this situation. Julian, greet them all. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to share like, my experience of being um, influenced by public opinions. Um, I grew up in the church, so growing up, you know when you're in the Sunday school, they'll be teaching you about what is wrong and what is right. So in all my life, I just wanted to please God. I just wanted to do what was right. To the point where if my mom would say, Julian, do something, I'd run, I'd do it. At school, I was never in trouble at school because I knew if I'm in trouble, God is not going to be pleased. And as well, I knew that the devil also will be pleased because now I'm coming against God. So this was what I knew. This is what I've always known. And then when I was 14 years old, where I was coming from the Sunday school, going to the youth group. So in that time, we didn't have PTU, so we just went straight to the, um, to the youth group. So in the youth group... And that's why now you are a PTU counselor as well <laughs> and coordinator, because we were missing that intermediary group, intermediary group to help our kids. From Sunday school, all of a sudden, they are in the youth. Huh? Yes. So going Shocking. To <laughs> Very. <laughs> going to the youth, um, I found new friends. So it was exciting that now, now I'm growing. I'm no longer that small child in the Sunday school. I'm in the youth. There's new friends. So what I remember the most is when I would be with the friends that I had at the church, at the youth group, they started speaking about their experiences of how they used to drink alcohol, how nice it was, what they did on Saturday. So I remember in my mind, I was like, wow, so we can be in the church and drink alcohol. But <laughs> when I was young, I knew that I, will never, I never wanted to drink alcohol. I wanted to be that adult that one day I'm going to tell my children that I've never drank alcohol because it was rare to find an adult who mm -hmm. had said they've never drank alcohol. And then my mom used to tell me how she used to drink alcohol. I remember she had a picture that picture, it was her next to a bottle of beer, alcohol. So when she was telling me, this is how my life was, and then I came to the church, my life changed. So I really admired her that, okay, wow, so she used to drink alcohol, now her life changed. And I was like, I don't want to go this route. I want to be clean and be that adult who's never tasted alcohol. But now when my friends were starting to speak how they drank alcohol, I felt like I was missing out. And I felt like I have nothing to speak about. So my first encounter of alcohol was with my school friends, because there as well, I'm studying high school. It's a new environment. Mm. It's new friends as well. So whenever they would speak, they would speak about alcohol as well. But I was the only one who's never tasted alcohol. I had no experiences. So I remember one day, it was after school. So we just came together, and then we spoke. How about we go to buy alcohol? And then we went. It was my first time drinking alcohol, and I was so excited that, oh, at least I'm going to have an experience as well to share of how it is um, to drink alcohol, forgetting that this is not what I wanted. 
because I wanted to be an adult who's never tasted alcohol. And now I forgot everything I learned. I forgot about God, pleasing God, because I want to please my friends. And you even forgot about your own decision. I forgot about my own decision. Because it was not your mom who said, you have to be like this. It was something personal. You said, I wanted to grow old and be able to tell my kids that I never tasted alcohol mm -hmm. and encourage them to, to do the, to same. Do the same. All of a sudden... The opinion, the influence of your friends was so strong that you even forgot your own commitment. I call it self-commitment because you committed yourself to yourself. I will not do that. And then you broke that promise. And then I broke the promise. And I remember when I started like tasting the alcohol, drinking, I was just so excited, not because it was me, but because... I have something to tell my friends. I have something to say as well. So I couldn't even wait to go to the church to tell my friends that, you know what, on Friday I went and I tasted alcohol, like just to share my experience as well. But it was really getting worse to the point where I became a liar. I was very deceitful because yes, I would drink alcohol, but my parents never knew. And I didn't want them to find out. So I would make ways of how I will go because it's extreme. Because the others, their parents knew, because there was one friend that I had, the parents knew that she drinks because we would go over to her house, 14 years old. We'd go to her house and then sit, the mother would be like, no, it's fine. So what I used to do is, I used to play hockey. So I was very good at hockey at school and my parents knew. So I would tell my mom that, no, on Saturday we have a hockey match, which, which we did not have because at school it was only during the week. But I would say, no, Saturday we have a hockey <laughs> match. And then she'd be like, okay, she would agree. And your mom would trust in you. She would really trust because I was, when I look back, I was like, I've never seen a liar like me because really <laughs> I was a true liar. Thanks to that we became friends would... when you quit lying. <laughs> Isn't that all? <okay? laughs> to the point where... We would even forge school letters, like only to give to my parents that for them to believe that no, yes, she's for them to trust me. I just wanted them to trust me. And then would forge letters, I'd give to them. They would believe. They would give me money for me to go to hockey. But I knew that I was going somewhere else to go and drink alcohol. So we'd drink alcohol. And I remember the worst time was when it was, the schools were closing, so we were all excited. We came together. We would speak about what we're going to dress. So here we are. I've never wore a mini skirt. I never liked mini skirts because I just didn't see why. But I ended up wearing, I remember we went to the shops, like after school we would go to the shops because our school was in town. So we went, we bought the same outfits, like the same tops, the same shorts for us to look alike so that we can call attention to wherever we were going. So that's when I started wearing mini skirts, which I hated, I don't know, but at that time I was just wearing just because everyone else was doing it. Mm. So I completely changed, I really lost myself. But on Sunday, Sundays I was in the church because I knew my mom wouldn't even accept. With this angel face, With this pretending angel to face. be this very good girl. <laughs> this was me. So Sundays I'm in the church, it's normal. It's just the normal day. But when my friends say, we are going where? We, I'm like, okay, when? And then we are going. So I remember this particular time where it was, the schools were closing. We went out, we had a lot of money because we used to take out money and combine. So we went, we bought a lot of alcohol and then we hired a taxi. So that taxi was taking us around. And then we met the police on the way. So it's teenagers, 14, 15 years old. Here we are, we have alcohol. The police stopped us mm. and then they asked, what's going on? We just stood there, and then we were like, no, they're not going to take our alcohol. They are going to leave us. Until a time where they said, you are coming with us. I was just like, oh, what is my mom going to say? Like, I was like, what did I get myself into? We went to the police station. I saw them taking out papers for us to write. So I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have a criminal record at this age. So while we were busy writing, filling in our details. 
Your friends were also afraid or only you? I believe we were all afraid because we were children. We were we were still young and we were all scared because I remember we were looking at each other. Our eyes were so big. We didn't know if we were going to be locked in cells, what was going to happen. So at that time, it's like, yeah, you are going to have a criminal record. That's what we would all think about. So I remember a friend of mine, while they were asking her her name, she lied. So she said a wrong name. She said a wrong address. I was like, yo, I can't give my right details. So I copied her, <laughs> and then I started speaking just a random name. I gave the wrong address of the, the address that she gave. So looking back, if it was like the me that I knew, I would always speak the truth. At that time, I would speak the truth, but I lied to the police with my details. So that's just how horrible it was. And how I, I'm interested to know what happened next. <laughs> Did you convince the police with your wrong address? What happened next, we had another friend, because we were a lot. It was just this large group where we called a friend of ours who used to live in our neighborhood. So we told him what was going on, because they just left us to call to make calls. We called him, and then he, he came. He was older. He was the same age as us, yeah. but because he was taller, it looked like he's an adult. And then now when he comes, he's also drunk. So we're like, how can you come like this? The police are going to, to arrest you. I was like, ah, I don't care and whatnot. And then he called his mom. Huh. So calling his mom, his mom um, came to bail us out because they told us, no, um, we, going, we need to be bailed out. So yeah. instead of calling our parents, his mother came. And the mother stays in the same neighborhood as us. The mother knows my mother as well. <laughs> So I was just so scared that she's going to tell my mom. And then the mother came, she bailed us, us, she bailed us out of the police station. Did you learn your lesson? No, I did not le learn my lesson. So everything that you were trying to do, you were trying to fit in into the group of those who have testimonies. Mm -hmm. Because if I understand well, some of the people were from the church yes. that you were together with. Yes. So because you didn't have a testimony, you were young, so you told yourself, I won't fit in if I don't have a testimony. So let me just do gel wrong. into this group and do what they do. Yes. And I remember... When and uh, something else I noticed, um, I don't know if you heard when she said, I didn't like alcohol, but I did. I didn't like mini skirts, but I dressed it. So many of the things, as we said in the beginning, for someone who's guided, a woman mostly, guided by people's opinion, commonly will do what she doesn't like, what she doesn't approve at, but just to please someone, to be part of the group, to fit in, to feel better about herself, she will end up doing. And you reminded me something, Miss Marcia, when you spoke about like the person, even if they don't like that, you know, they will end up doing. I had a cousin of mine, she passed on, may her soul rest in peace, just because she wanted to fit in into a certain community because she was dating a guy. She ended up being a Muslim. And she, I, we asked her, okay, we don't have a problem. What religion? It's not a matter of the religion. It's not a matter. But when you talk to her, she said, I don't like to dress like this. I don't like to put on these things. But why are you doing it? No, because, you know, and I, I work with these people. I'm the only Christian there, you know. So when I talk about Pentecostal church, they always put me down. So I just said, let me just fit in. Even though I don't like, I really don't like, I don't even know what I'm doing there, but she ended up there. Because of pressure. Yeah. She didn't see her own value in her own purpose of being the Christian she was. In the same way, all that you learned in, in Sunday school, all the promises you made to yourself, you end up breaking them. It's painful because for her, she had four friends who are Muslim, and they were even telling her, we are not judging you because you are a Christian. But you see, just because of the two that put you down, you disregard us, the four that do not even put you down. Because she wanted to please everybody. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then, I'm curious to know also if this mother went and knocked at your doors and told your moms what you had done. Ms. Masha, she didn't go and tell oh. our mothers. She oh. kept it to herself. And I believe if she had went and told our parents, we would have stopped. But because she didn't go, so it was like, oh, okay, so we managed no to escape this one. There's no consequences. So we continued. And it was just becoming worse and worse and worse to the point where I remember there was a time as well it was during the week where it was on a Wednesday. That Wednesday, instead of going to the church, uh, there was a youth meeting on Wednesdays. I didn't go, I was like, ah, today I'm not going to the youth. And then we went and then our, like there was a reception at school. So it was starting at 5 p.m., like in the afternoon. So I told my parents that it's starting at seven o'clock so that I can come later at home. So, I did, I went, and then it came out. Others, their parents came to take them, came to pick them up, but our group of friends, we stayed behind. There were a group of guys that I've never seen, I've never met as well, but they were also there at our school event. So one of the friends that we had knew them. So others went home, and then we just went around roaming to different places where they sell alcohol. I remember when it was time to go home, I was like, hey, I want to go home because it's late and I know my mother's getting worried. But one friend was like, no, we'll go home. Wait, at least we'll go home around 1 p.m. And tomorrow it's a school day. So I listened to her and I was like, oh, no, I'll go tomorrow. I mean, I'll go at 1 o'clock. But now we went to a place I've never been before. We are in a location. The guys that we were with, I do not know those guys. I've never seen them. We are in a location I've never been to. Now we want to go home. The guys are like, no, we can't take you home. We don't have transport to take you home. So for me, I was just getting worried. That time, my battery is dead. And I'm like, my parents are busy calling me and I am here. At least they would come maybe to fetch me. If there are consequences, I will just accept them. And then we stayed there until I think it was around five o'clock or six o'clock the next in the day, morning. In the morning. And that day, it's a school day. So... No, but you haven't been home. I so have, even before being a school day, you should have, you should have gone home gone to tell home your parents you were right. As a proper right. child. So How old were you? That incident, because it started when I was 14, so it continued for two years. 14 and... 15, that time I was 15, I remember I was in grade 9. And your nine. parents is still believing you were that good girl. Yes, my, my parents still believed. But now, I just thought now it's going to change because where was I the last night? I told my parents that I'm going to the school event, it's going to come out, I'm going to come home. But now I slept somewhere else. What if I was killed? What if something bad happened to me? And then now when we go home, we are all going different direction. Everyone is going to where they live. Now I have to go alone, home, without any friends to support me. I need to look at my parents' faces and tell them where I was. And I remember my mom was so, so angry. The first thing she said when I walked in, she was like, we are going to the doctor and you are going to tell, we are going to the doctor to make a pregnancy test. <laughs> And in my mind, I'm like, but I never slept with any boy. I did tell him, like, mom, but I never slept with any boy. She's like, I do not believe you. We are going to the doctor. And then somehow we didn't go. She just let it go. So, but I was in trouble. But the lies didn't stop. The deceit didn't stop. So it still was not enough for you to learn your lesson. It still wasn't enough. And also, I think from when you were uh, arrested, I think the woman who came to bail you out, she was supposed to be a strong woman and tell your mom because now you didn't learn your lesson because she didn't say anything, so you thought you got away with everything. You continued, you didn't learn your lesson there. And then time passed by. It was just getting worse. Just, like when I just picture in my mind going back that how can I put myself in such a situation? Getting worse, sometimes would be three nights. I remember I was three a professional nights. liar. <laughs> I was really a professional yeah. liar. Um, I remember that the other time I told my mom that, no, I'm going with my friend and her parents. 
their parents were assistants in the church. So I told her that, no, we are going with uh, my friends' um, parents who are assistants. She knew, she believed as well. She, she never even asked, she never called them. She so she believed. And then we went, that time it was now three days because we were gonna go on Friday, Saturday and come back Sunday. But somewhere, somehow, my mom found out that it was a lie. She called the assistants and they said, no, we don't know anything about that. She called me, you need to come back home now. I wanted to go back home. My friends were like, no, don't go home. So I listened to my friends like, hi, I'll deal with my parents when I get home on Sunday. Mm. So that three days, I just didn't care. I was like, no, I'll deal with my parents. When I see them, I will face now the Now you music. had no more respect for the parents yes. or fear of consequences. Yes. So I went back home and then my mom, I don't know, I think my mom was just tired because my mom was strict. My mom was, to me, my mom was very strict. But when your strict mom keeps quiet, it just scares you that why is she quiet? Like, why is she not saying anything? What is she going to do? What is she going to, what's going in through her mind? So it was all these questions. And then my father came, they sat me down, then they spoke and spoke and spoke and spoke. But did I stop? I did not. Sure. I did not. It was all about my friends. I need to keep it up. Because even at school, I was becoming popular. Because when you are popular, they're like, oh, we saw you. Where, where? Oh, we saw you at this place. So you become well known because you met with them at a certain place. So for me, it was like, oh, okay, I'm getting well known. People know my name. A lot so of when you think me. about that young girl who wanted to do everything right, to be according to God's way, ain't the popular girl in school, at that moment, being popular brought more value to you. It boosted your ego and... Forget about being good. Forget about the lessons you learned. Forget about what your parents were teaching you at home. That's very true, Ms. Mash. Because looking back, I wanted to be an assistant. Like when I was young, I would see my Sunday school teacher. She was an assistant. I was like, I want to be like her. I want to be, because I always hear sometimes when the bishop is like, you know, I didn't want to be a pastor, but I was like, I wanted to serve God I didn't want to be a pastor's wife. <laughs> so... For me, it was different because I really wanted to serve God. My mom used to speak a lot about the sacrifices that the pastors do. So for me, I was like, I want to be like this. I want to help other people as my mom was helped. I want to give myself, but all that went out of the window and I forgot about it. And I remember one instant when I was like, as Ms. Toko, you were saying that, I wanted to have a testimony as well that, okay, now I'm going to be an assistant. What about the testimony? What am I going to say? What did I do? What did I experience? Mm. How will I help people if I don't have anything to say? And it was just a mess. And I remember another time where I was like, no, I'm 14 years old. I'll change when I'm 20 years old. Because counting 14 years to 20 years, it seemed like a very long time. Because I knew if I die, I'll go to hell. So I just said, no, I'll change when I'm 20 years old. Then I'm matured, I'm growing. Then I'll give my life to God. So that was what was in my mind. Junin, what were you, the bad choices that you made because of friendship, because of people's influence? Um, the bad choices that I had made, besides from alcohol, was being a rebel, because I was now becoming a rebellious child. Um, I was a big liar. And going out at night, like who, child, a child that goes out at night is just something else. And I was very empty inside. I lost who I was. I was just in this fight because when you're alone, reality comes. And even if you try to run away, you try to justify, but you know yourself better than anyone else. So it would catch me when I'm alone. I'd just be lost and so empty there would be just this void inside of me that there's something that is missing and now to fill it up friends but I was just getting worse and worse were you hanging around with boys I was hanging around with boys 
But I was afraid of boys because I knew if I sleep with a boy, I might be pregnant, I might have HIV and AIDS. And I remember I had cousins who were infected with this disease. So for me, looking back, it helped me a lot because boys were there, boys were always around. Sometimes it will be three girls and maybe 10 boys around us. But I just had this thing of when a boy comes, I was just be holding myself back. So that when But I what would back, your friends say? My friends would be like, like what experience will you have? Because sometimes they'll be like kissing boys and then now, ah, I kissed a boy and whatnot. So for me, it was like, I can't. When a boy tries to come close to me, I'd just be, and they would lose interest because they liked girls that were like out there. So with the boys, I was just always afraid that if I come close to a boy, I'm going to be pregnant. My mom is going to see the stomach that I'm not going to be able to hide. So that was my biggest fear with boys. And that's why you didn't hang around much with them, just because you were afraid. Yes. But voices were there pushing you to. Voices were there because, Julian, you don't have any experience. People are speaking just like the experience of alcohol. I drank alcohol, I could speak about it. Now sleeping with a boy, I don't have any experience, but I, I just don't know what kept me not to go there. Because now when I look back, I'm like, oh, imagine if I slept with At all the boys. At night, hanging around with this group of few girls, lots of boys, going to places you didn't know, you were all in danger. And in the name of popularity, there are many people that like to be popular. They want to be popular, so they want to fit in into a certain group. It doesn't matter even if it's going to, to hurt their family members or even if it's going to destroy their image. They do not care. I want to be popular. Many people outside there, they do wrong things in the name of popularity. Because you see that you were feeling good when you felt like, now I'm popular, I'm that well-known child in school, so let me do more so that I can be more popular. But at the end of the day, it wasn't doing you any good because you said, when you go home, when you are alone, mm. your conscience will hit you. That is why there is a saying that there is no softer pillow than a clean conscience. Yeah. yeah. Did something happen that made you turn around and go back to who you were before. Yes. Um, and that... Oh. <laughs> no, <sorry. laughs> no, yes. And that we are going to hear just after our break. We're holding you curious. What was her turning point? Stay tuned. I 
Welcome back. And now I'm really curious to know what made Julian to quit that life because she could have gone far deeper into that self-destruction for the purpose of pleasing people. She started lying, drinking. She started being popular in school and she could have gone very wrong. But I asked her, did something happen? And she said, yes, and now you're going to hear what happened. Um, the turning point of my life was still in the same way of living with friends. I remember we were going out, it was at night. I had also lied to my parents. Again? So, again. How so, old were you? This time I was 16 years old. Yeah, I was 16 years old. I was in grade 10. So... What happened was we were in this car that we would always hire. It was taxis, we would always hire. Now we were there jumping in the car. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, the tire, the back tire came out. So we could see the tire in front of us, like, cause it was a steep going down. So we could see the tire going and the car moving sideways. So that's where it hit me that, no, I'm going to die today and I'm going to hell. So everything just came back to me that, here we are, we were like in an accident, like it was a, mi a very minor accident, but I would have died. So for me, it rang a bell that, Julian, if you die today, you would straight be in hell. So I woke up, I was like, I am no longer going to live this life. Although that night, for some reason, we, com we continued. Another taxi came and took us. So we continued, I went back home, but it just was in my mind that that night I would have died. I'd be in hell. Everything that I learned growing up from the Sunday school, what my teachers used to say, what they used to preach about in the church, came back to me that your life is just a mess and really you are going to hell. So 
I took a moment and I was like, I want to change my life. And then I decided that I'm going to give God everything. I don't care anymore about what my friends say. And I remember specifically, now it was the following year, where I was like, I'm changing my life. I decided to get baptized in water. I've never been baptized in water because my mom was guiding me in the things of faith. I remember she would tell me what water baptism is. So I, I was never baptized. So that day I was like, I'm going to really give my life to God. And after school, instead of going with my friends, because we used to go together, I went straight to the church and I told the pastor that I would like to be baptized in water. I was baptized in water and then Bit by bit, I was trying to change, stopping to go out. And I remember one friend, she was very, very close to me from school. She was like, ah, Julian, you, do you really think you're going to change? You're busy now going to church. You're, not, you're no longer going with us to the taxi rank when we go home. So I was like, I'm going to change. I'm going to give you two months. Two months, you'll be back to who you were. So for me, I had decided nothing was going to change my mind. Even as she was saying that two months, I was like, I'm going to show her that two months, I will not be that same person. So gradually I changed and then we stopped being friends. For some reason, I didn't have friends anymore. And it scared me because now I don't have friends. How come I'm alone? But it didn't matter because I really wanted to change. I really wanted to give my life to God. So even if my friends were drifting away from me, I was okay with it. For the first time, I was happy being alone because now I had my own mind. I knew what I wanted and I was standing firm into what I want. Because even when I received the Holy Spirit, it, it did not take long. This for me is something that I always think about that. Immediately I got baptized in water. After two months, I received the Holy Spirit. So I just saw that, God, I was a mess, but you took me. It was like this glass that was broken, and God fixed, mended this glass, because it's impossible to fix a glass that is broken. But with me, God took all those pieces. The same year I started serving God as an assistant. It was just showing that, but I decided no one could change. They spoke. They said many things, but I was there. Would they try? Would they come by, invite you? They tried, they would come. Ah, did you hear about something that is happening where, where I'm like, uh, I'm not interested. And your popularity in school declined. Declined. <laughs> it really declined to a point where, cause I still loved hockey. So I would play hockey and I gave my best in hockey. It was in the first team, it was going well. But friends wise, I, I didn't have friends. I, I had two friends, so now we were three. So these friends, I remember our, Metric farewell, because after the metric farewell, there's after parties. Mm -hmm. So there, I am an assistant already. They are speaking after parties. I don't even want to hear about what they are saying. And what I love the most was my two new friends were now listening to what I was saying, because I said, guys, I'm not going to the after party. After the metric farewell, I'm going back straight home. They also said, I, I'm also going home. We didn't even have dates. We were each other's date, dates, the three of us. We didn't have guys with us, so we just went there. So I just looked back. I was like, wow, this person that used to be influenced, that used to be wanting this public approval is the one that is influencing others in a good way. So with my friends, yeah. we, went, we went back home, and I slept at home. But if I, when I looked back, that this Julian... Mm -hmm. The old Julian would have said, hi, I'm going to this place, but I didn't go. So it was a transformation to a point where now I finished my metric. I had to come to Varsity. So now I came to, to Johannesburg. Ooh, where everything <laughs> happens, where the party starts and ends. So coming to Johannesburg, I remember, Miss Masha, I made a prayer. And I was like, my God, I am going to Joburg, there I don't have parents who are looking at me. I don't have anyone who's, who will tell me or look at the time I go back home. And I, when I go to Joburg, I want to grow. I want to grow in serving you. And I was excited that, yeah, I'm going to serve in Park Station. I'll be there. So for me, it was all about wanting to grow. 
And when I came um, to Park Station, I was in the youth enjoying. I was just growing because I used to see back home, whenever they come to university, especially the assistants, they don't go back home as assistants. So it used to bother me a lot that, my God, I want to be the first one who will come back as an assistant from Joburg, and it happened. Where were you staying at, at rest? I was staying, um, first when I came, I was staying with my aunt uh -huh. and my uncle. So we found rest, but now what I did, I investigated. I was like, I'm not just going to live just anyway. I found a friend, an assistant in the church, and to share, like, who wants a roommate. And then one told me, no, we have assistant Kanye who I used to live with. So I was like, I want to live with, with an assistant. I don't want to live with anyone who's yeah. an unbeliever who will pull me back. So I found Kanye and then I told my parents that I found an assistant in Park Station. So we serve together. We are in the youth together. Can I live with At her? At uni, were you tempted, bombarded? It was a place where, because now we are all young. It's like a mini town of young people. Mm. So when you look, wherever you look, it's a young person. So there's events, there's many things that are happening. And no, after school, we are going to this place. Or sometimes there'll be maybe five days before or on the 12th or on the 15th, we are going somewhere. Kid December boss. Kid December boss. So <laughs> they would plan, but I was just not interested. I wouldn't even give ear to what they are saying. And they speak things that when they would speak, I would just be so irritated that I can't listen to what they are saying. They would speak about drinking, wherever they were going, sex. Like, it would really frustrate and irritate me. So as we are together, they would speak. I'd just stand up and go because I, I didn't I, want to I hear. I think the voice of God became louder than the voice of your peers or yeah. your friends. Yes. So after school... When we are done with lectures, I just want to come to the church Wednesday. I didn't give time to friendships. I, even my friends in varsity, I was like, okay, I chose because I saw mm -hmm. these other two girls. There were one from, was from Limpopo, another one, I think she was from Joburg. But that other one was more reserved. So I was like, this is the one that I'm going to make my friend. So whenever we would speak, it was all about school. Like maybe her family, background, she was also not a person to go out. So for me, it was just something that, no, I, these other things I'm not interested in. And she was very, very intelligent because when her marks would come, I'd see 90s and 80s. I'm like, I'm going to compete with this one. And I would ask her, how do you do it? And then she would help me. And I was just competing with her for me to grow as a person. After the lecture, I come straight to church or I go straight home. And with my roommate, I grew so much spiritually because it was all about, oh, what are we going to do in the church? We are going to evangelize. Everything was just spiritual. I just didn't have room for negativity. I didn't have room for anything of the world. And I saw that I hated it because I just know where it leads you to. But you closed that door. Yeah. That's the most important point of it. She had the option, she had the opportunity again, imagine, coming from another place to Johannesburg, to Varsity, staying away from parents. It's the perfect conditions for someone to live what they say, the best of her life. True, true. But you didn't give yourself I into because not. you knew how low you had been to. Yes, and I wasn't even thinking about it. Like when it irritates you, then that's when you see that this is how much God is irritated. Like, like vulgar words, they were just not things that I wanted to associate myself with. Mm -hmm. So this is the difference that I saw that, wow, like really God. What was the me. difference you saw from that Julian to now this Julian? The difference that I saw was that I was more decisive and mm -hmm. now I could not be influenced just easily i was a person who takes a decision that i'm like okay this is wrong and it's wrong because i knew what was wrong i knew what was right but back then i knew what was wrong but i would still go against who i was and what i knew but this time what was wrong was wrong and that was it 
We, there was no negotiations. There was just nothing. I was just... had a backbone. Yes, I had a backbone. I had a backbone. Did you value yourself? I did not value myself back then. I did not value myself. And now, because I did not value myself, anything was just coming to me, and I would just absorb, absorb. But I saw now that I had value, that you no, know, when you are in God, now you have value. But there, I, I don't know what... If you would ask me back then, did you have value? I'd be like, yes, I had value, but knowing that I didn't have, but I really did not have value back because then. Because you would project your value in your friendships in pleasing them. Yes. And when you found yourself alone, living truthfully for your own promises, I will go, I will finish my course, I will come back as an assistant, and you were truthful to your own commitment, you found value in yourself, the value that God was giving to you. And that leads us to God's point in this. Now, let's see God's point in this. God says, you are valuable. So in the book of Matthew 6, 26, Jesus said, Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than them? Jesus made a comparison between human beings and birds, those beautiful creatures that fly and sing around, but so vulnerable, that God was responsible for them because they were created by God, let alone each one of us as human beings that were created not only to be part of the world, but to become children of God. So if God took care of the birds, God take care of the creation, moreover, he wants to take care of you. And why? Because he values you. How many women, they had a disastrous life. They don't have a future. They are empty. Not because of what they dreamed, they wanted. But actually because of what they did on behalf of pleasing people, pleasing family, doing what was popular, and now they see themselves without value. God is the one who gives us value. God is the one who brings meaning to your life. But you need to decide. Remember, Julian said, I will go and I will come back serving God. So all her actions... During the time she had the best of opportunities, she was an adult, she was alone in Johannesburg, she was surrounded by youngsters, but she said, I will choose my friends. When I'm finished with what I came here to do, that is to study, I'll go to the church. She looked for endorsement in what really mattered for her, and in that way she grew spiritually. How many had the same opportunity? And they came. Maybe you are one of them. They came and said, I will have the best time of my life. I will um, finish my course. I will get my degree. And because of hanging around with the wrong friends, being guided by public opinion, by what people say you have to do, how you have to dress, how you have to carry yourself out, you went home, you went back home without a degree, maybe a single mother, destroyed, addicted. And when you look at yourself now, you say, I don't have a purpose for living. God wants to give to you the value. In the same way he takes care of the birds, he wants to take care of you. So that you understand what I'm talking about, I want you to watch carefully this little promo that talks about the majesty of God.
beautiful isn't that but god wants to do the same in your life so today's conclusion of the matter is now for the conclusion of the matter a strong woman knows her value given by god not necessarily by the opinion of people by the decision of people or what is trending out there what social media is telling you a strong woman values herself because she knows god values her she knows that in god she will have what she needs to carry on what really matters she does not mind to be popular with people but she wants to be popular with god that was your decision that you wanted to decision. be popular with god you wanted to grow with him so that's why i'm going to ask julian to pray who knows for young girls for mature women out there who today are going to have this decision they are going to invest in being popular with god they will become strong women shall we pray my father in the name of the lord jesus christ name my god it is a privilege for me to be sitting here today my god because i got this opportunity that comes from you to see the value that i have my god because you are the one that gives me this value my god i present to you those young ladies just like me who grew up in the church who were very confused they do not even know my god what to do but my father i ask you that may you give them the strength for them to see that in you there is true value also my father those women that are influenced by public opinion my god wherever the world goes they go there my god may you show to them that the world really has nothing to offer my god but when you receive us with open arms then we have everything that we need my father may they receive this understanding that my god this world really has nothing to offer to them that the public has nothing my god to give to them but when they are popular in you then they have everything that they need I surrender the lives of these ladies whoever is watching it might be a man it might be a young guy in the church my god may they see their true value which comes only from you my god we thank you for this show of today because i believe that whoever will watch the show whoever went through what i went through or is going through what i went through my god may they have my father this decision to be rooted in you and to know that with everything that they did the past does not matter but what matters is the decision that they take right now at this moment we surrender their lives into your holy hands and above everything else thank you my god for this opportunity in jesus name amen amen before we go not so soon next week good friday would you believe that and the last behavior of a strong woman has everything to do with good friday so first i want to invite you to join us for our morning and then to come back to friday 3 p.m. so that you learn which is this last behavior that is directly connected with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ you are our our guest poverty unemployment economic stagnation gender based violence and addiction these are the challenges that we face every day but you can beat it amandla ngawetu 23 take the power now to change your life yea though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i will fear no evil for you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me good friday the 7th of april at 10 a.m. at the soweto cathedral 24456 amunk drive zone 6 deep cloth and at every provincial universal church 
in South Africa. Power, it is ours. Hoping to see you in one of our churches. Until next week, God bless you all. Bye-bye. Oh, wow. You must be Neo, the one who came up with the brilliant proposal. Okay, but I am not Katleho. Do I tell her? Uh, yes. Well done. You get a promotion. No. What does it take to stand up for your beliefs, even when the odds are against you? How does a strong woman then react? Join us in the fifth and final episode of the series, What a Strong Woman Doesn't Do, Wave on Her Values, Friday at 3 p.m.